Hello, fellow nature enthusiasts. My name is Anna Valdez, and I am an intern with the Natural Resource Partnership Team for the Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park. I am so excited you could join us today, and we are doing a series of interviews with experts to tell people how they can find biodiversity close to home. This could be either in your house, your backyard, or on your block, or in a nearby park. Collecting information about biodiversity to better understand the types and numbers of species that live around us is fun, enriching, and contribute to science. To learn more about how to capture and share biodiversity data, we have a video about how to use apps and how to participate. Participate. Please visit the link below to learn more. Today, we have the amazing opportunity to talk to an expert in the plant field, Mark Albert. Mark Albert is an expert in the plant field and works with, as the manager of the Natural Resource Partnership for the Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park. Thank you, Mark Albert, for joining us today. We are so excited to be able to talk to you and have you share some knowledge with us today. Hi, Anna, thanks. Can you briefly tell us a little bit about who you are and share about the field in which you are an expert in? Sure. Um, I studied plants uh, as in, uh, in graduate school, specifically invasive plant ecology and biology. And I've spent my entire National Park Service career uh, working in coastal urban areas where there are lots of people who can help us take care of the plants and, and habitats of the parks and also lots and lots of invasive species. So what got you interested in learning more about plants? Well, I went to graduate school in California, and I think the general answer is California got me excited about learning about plants. Um, there's something called the California Floristic Province, which is uh, which encompasses most of California and actually the little bits of some other adjacent states. And it's called that because it's got such a unique and vast array of different kinds of native plant species. Um, you know, from, from mountaintop species to coastal species and everything in between. Uh, where I worked in California after finishing my school was in the Presidio of San Francisco, where in a very small patch of land, there are uh, many, many endangered plant species, and they live in all in different kinds of habitats that are closely packed together. There's coastal dunes, and there's rare plant species that occur in the coastal dunes right there. And then just, you know, 500 feet up the beach, in some cases, there are unusual rocks that are formed in volcanic uh, habitats called serpentine rocks. And, serpent and the soils that are derived from those rocks have a whole different set of rare plant species that live on them. So I was just, I just got so excited about the local diversity and so concerned about the fact that many invasive species were taking over these habitats that it just sort of hooked me into loving plants and, and sort of appreciating how plants are distributed across the landscape and, and uh, sort of how, how, much, how much there is to learn and explore and be part of uh, out there in the world of plants. Awesome. So what type of habitats do plant species prefer? Well, um, plants are simple in a way. They, they need sunlight, they need water, and they need nutrients. Mm -hmm. um, so they live where they can find those resources and where they can compete with each other well enough to survive. Um, the overall patterns of where plants live has to do with the resources that are available in any given place. So uh, in a very bright and sunny area, you'll get plants that, can, that compete really well for sun. Uh, in different kinds of soils will dictate what kinds of plants can survive and compete well in those environments. So, um, and how much water can the soil hold is another big factor. Some soils are very, drain very quickly and some soils hold water for a long time. And each of those kinds of areas will have different kinds of plant species. So when you look across a landscape scale here in the Northeast, where you, know, you see forests, fields and meadows, and then open water habitats. And within the forests, fields, and meadows, there are, there are more upland, drier sites, and then there are lower wetland sites. So that, that's sort of the big picture. And then in the coastal habitats, of course, you get some more specific um, 
you know, sort of shoreline species and species that can tolerate salt spray and things like that. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, so do any of these areas intersect with places people live? Yeah, uh, all of those. Uh, all those habitats I just described are where we all live. That's one of the things that's the, the best uh, in terms of being a naturalist and just someone paying attention to the natural world uh, here in the Northeast is that we basically all live and work and, and recreate in the native landscapes here. So the, the forest, fields, meadows, riverways, pond shores, uh, you know, beaches, et cetera, are, those are the natural habitats for plants and those are where we, we live and work. Perfect. So what kind of species will people most likely find in the Boston area? In terms of trees, uh, probably the most abundant trees across, you know, sort of Eastern Massachusetts would be red oak and Eastern white pine, um, particularly in areas that are drier and with, uh, with um, where, where the glaciers had deposited big, uh, big amounts of, of soil, uh, you know, about 10,000 years ago, oaks, red oaks, and, uh, and eastern white pines particularly thrive in those kinds of environments. There are other areas with a little bit richer soils, a little bit uh, that hold moisture a little bit better, where you might get uh, hickory, beech, ash, and other species. And in all sorts of, in all across the landscape, in areas that have been relatively recently disturbanced, disturbed, uh, species that can, that can come in quickly and grow fast do well, such as gray birch, black cherry, um, and uh, quaking aspen. Also, in coastal areas, such as the Boston Harbor Islands, there are tree species that compete particularly well there, including um, red cedar. Um, and... It, Going from the trees to the shrubs, there's a, a tall, very ubiquitous shrub called staghorn sumac that does particularly well in coastal environments where it can tolerate the salt spray better than other things. Um, going further down from the canopy to the ground, um, there's of course lots of uh, uh, common shrubs and, and wildflower, herbaceous wildflowers. Uh, there are many, many species of goldenrods which tend to bloom in from, from late summer into the fall. Uh, and many people will be familiar with milkweed, uh, which is a beautiful flowering plant that is also very important to as it provides monarch habitat. There are many invasive plant species that are very common as well. Everything I mentioned so far are native species of the Northeastern US. Probably the most abundant uh, and most sort of landscape defining invasive species here in, in Eastern Massachusetts would be Norway maple. You can tell Norway maple from the native maple species um, by picking any leaf and looking to see whether it has milky sap because Norway maple has milky sap, whereas red maple or sugar maple, which is the, the tree that maple syrup comes from, um, they have clear sap. There's also a very, very abundant invasive vine called bittersweet, which has a very beautiful orange and red uh, uh, fruiting fruits that are used often in uh, holiday reeds, et cetera. And that's the most likely species you will see densely vining and twining from tree to tree in, in many habitats and can really cause a problem in, in forested areas as well as in people's yards, et cetera. So why is it so important for us to document these species? Yeah. Um, Sort of on the, on the big scale at the regional level and, and for us as park managers, we want to document what's out there in order to um, protect biodiversity over the long term. Um, the natural habitats, the, the plants and animals and uh, the physical elements of the environment, the, the, you know, the soils and the water that moves through the environment, the, the air, um, they are integrated into a system that uh, what that provides what we call ecological services. And that's kind of a, it's, it's actually used almost in a sort of an economic framework to, to assess, um, uh, to, in order to quantify the value of the natural world. But what it really means is things like clean water, clean air, um, uh, even aesthetic values, um, and also things like, uh, 
the chemicals that are that that are used in most pharmaceuticals are ultimately derived from natural products somewhere in the world. So preserving biodiversity has both sort of the local effects of literally cleaning the air, if we're talking about you know urban street trees, for example, um, and cleaning the water in terms of um, plants that grow in wetlands or or in the you know uh, watersheds around wetlands, um, to uh, uh, providing. The, you know, the future pharmaceuticals that might end up helping us, you know, cure diseases and help our help make our lives better. Also, I would just say personally, um, I'll always remember my uh, sort of my mentor when I was when I was an undergrad um, talking about why he loved plants so much. And he said he grew up um, as kind of an army brat all around the world and plant families are common across the, you know, across the world. There's you know, the, the golden rods that occur here are part of a very large plant family that occurs all across the world. So he could be his, you know, his family was stationed in Germany and he could find plants from, you know, the Aster family and he could find plants from the mustard family and he could find plants from the honeysuckle family. And he just said it made him feel at home anywhere he was in the world. And I've always found that to be very inspirational, even though I don't know all the plants around me at all times, even though you know there's lots I don't know. Um, but having some way to feel familiar with the, the, the natural space you're in, it, it, it makes me feel less bored and just more connected and, and just happy about the world around me. That's great. So when we're thinking about plants globally, um, are there any concerns that you have about uh, plants related to climate change? Sure. Um, I think that uh, plants have, you know, si since plants evolved, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago, um, they have moved across the, you know, the Earth's surfaces and, and the waters of the Earth um, as the Earth's climates have, climate has changed. And as you know, and plants are very good in general at um, uh, at adapting in uh, both in the short term. You know, within one plant's for just one plant can be good at adapting to when it's got more water, when it's when there's more rain falling or when there's less rain falling. And then if you um, think about plants across generations, plants are very good at evolving to um, to new situations. If you you know mountains form across landscapes that didn't have mountains when you're thinking about a span of millions of years. And the plants that live there need to need to evolve to keep up with these new mountainous habitats and their shallow soils and the colder temperatures and the fact that there's going to be ice during part of the year. So that those, those plant lineages need to evolve over time to adapt to those changing climates. What's happening in this era of modern very, very, very rapid climate change is the the changes in temperature and uh, precipitation patterns um, and big disturbances that come from from large storm events. They're happening much, much more frequently than uh, in recorded history, for sure. Um, and it appears that the plants and the insects and birds and other you know other species that um, live in the habitats with them are not are going to be challenged to keep up with the rapid climate change now. And so I'm very concerned that the, uh, the value that the plants have within an ecosystem might be, uh, might be the, 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 the changes in temperature precipitation might be leading to disconnects between, for example, when a flower, when a species of flower is first blooming in the spring and the insects that are counting on feed, uh, pollinating those flowers and getting the nectar from those flowers and when they are showing up and when they're hatching themselves. Um, there are many, many studies that are now starting to show the, these disconnects and we don't know what the sort of small or larger scale impacts might be on individual species and habitats and those ecosystem services. But that's the general concern about um, that, that the, the, what the field of what's called phenology is now studying. 
And actually, there's a very um, active uh, citizen science effort related to studying phenology across the landscape, across the world. Um, there's a, a great site called Nature's Notebook, where individuals or groups can track the timing of, of plants or things like frogs and when they're singing in their ponds in the spring or uh, other, you know, pl plants and animals. Um, and, and then as that data builds up over time, we'll have a much better opportunity to, to tell whether the different species within an ecosystem and within a food web are sort of uh, are, are adapting in parallel with each other or there's mismatches that might be a concern for preserving some of the species. Great, sounds like there's a lot that we can do to help scientists with this. So is there a common species that brings you delight? Oh, there are so many. <laughs> uh, as I said, red maples in spring are probably, and, and skunk cabbage, which are um, little cabbage looking, uh, or kind of big cabbage looking plants that grow in the shallow wetlands uh, at the same time that the red maples are are sending forth their, their bursting dark red uh, flower buds at their, their twig tips. Um, in the summer and fall, probably the plant I enjoy the most, in particular in the coastal habitats and in the, on the Harbor Islands is staghorn sumac with its very, the, the, it's called staghorn sumac because the branches are, are densely fuzzy the way that, um, that, that the, uh, uh, horns of a stag are get fuzzy when they're when they're um, before they wipe their their fur off uh, the fuzz off of their horns um, and then in the winter I guess the all the different conifers or the the, the cone bearing species like pines and spruce and um, and cedars and many others that that uh, that still retain their green leaves through the whole winter. Well, I can't wait to go out into my backyard in my local park to see if I can find any of those. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today, Mark Albert. It has been a joy talking to you and learning about plants. I know um, I'm excited to go out with my roommate and go find some of these in our local park. From all of us at the Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park, we hope you have learned something new. Please share your discoveries with us uh, using social media and with the iNaturalist app.